The Gospel of John, chapter number 8. I hope you are enjoying our journey through uh, the Gospel of John. This is the first time that we have done this on a Sunday morning, studying through one of the Gospels. And so, uh, I'm enjoying There's a couple of reasons I enjoy it. Number one, I love knowing where I'm heading next week. Uh, and so I get to kind of study ahead a little bit and kind of uh, add it to there. Uh, and it also, when studying a book like this, you've got to cover all of the verses. And so uh, I've noticed sometimes as I'm studying John, looking at different commentaries and different things, uh, you'd be surprised some of them will just skip verses. And of course, those are normally the verses that I want to know more about. And so I guess they, they didn't want to dig deep either, so they just kind of <laughs> skip that part. And so it's good. It makes us study the whole book. Uh, and then it also gives you something that you can go home and you know, okay, we finished up at this verse this week. That means we'll be at this verse uh, the next week. And so I hope you are taking advantage of that. Uh, last week we uh, finished up our uh, look at, at chapter number 7, uh, the Feast of the Tabernacles. Uh, is now over uh, and everybody was returning to their own homes. Uh, the scribes and the Pharisees and, uh, had even more animosity toward Jesus than they had before. Uh, and they were uh, seeking even a greater occasion to arrest him and get him out of the way. He was, uh, uh, they didn't like what he was teaching because it was contrary to what they were teaching. Uh, isn't it amazing that people just don't want to know the truth and instead of uh, accepting the truth and adjusting to that truth, let's just do away with that truth. If we can do away with it, then it's not true. True. I got news for you. It's true whether you want to admit it or not. And one day every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. It doesn't matter whether you want to believe it or not. That is what's going to happen. I shared this week on my, one of my social platforms. I said the problem uh, that people don't want to admit that there's a heart problem going on. Uh, they want to blame everything else for what's going on in our nation except for the heart. The reason they don't want to blame the heart, because if you start blaming the heart, then you have to admit that we need God. And they don't want to admit that we need God, because there's only one thing that can change the heart, and that's God. Uh, and so they're looking for Him, and they're trying to find a reason now to get Him out the way, which sets the stage for what we're going to see here as we move into chapter number 8. Uh, it seems as they have decided to go the route of catching Jesus doing something that He's not supposed to do or, or teaching something that violated the law and they figure if they can find that, then they can turn the people against Him and then they can arrest Him. Right now, He's got too many people following Him. Uh, and so they know if they arrest Him, it's going to cause a great uproar uh, amongst the people. And so uh, let's, let's find a violation. And if we find that violation, then we can turn the people against him, then we can arrest him and accomplish what they want. So they tried that back with the healing of the crippled man on the Sabbath day. We just finished looking at that and that backfired on them. Uh, because Jesus brought up the fact that uh, they said that he was working on the Sabbath day by healing this crippled man. Jesus brought up the fact that they were performing circumcisions on the Sabbath day. Uh, and so if you had to go by the letter of the law, they were violating the law just as much as he did. Uh, and so that didn't work for them. It kind of backfired on them. Uh, and so uh, they decide another trap. And that brings us to where we are this week. They're going to try and set another trap for Jesus. And uh, I hope that you've read ahead. Guess what? That trap is going to backfire too. Uh, you have noticed that I have named the sermon this morning Outwitted. Because every time they try to corner Jesus, every time they think they have Jesus cornered, He outwits them. Okay, uh, I'm reminded, I grew up, and this is probably not correct anymore. There, there's probably something that offends somebody about this. Uh, any coyote lovers here? Coyote lovers, so maybe this isn't offensive to you. How many watched the Roadrunner and Coyote growing up? Anybody remember that? You know, the coyote always thought he had the plan, didn't he? 
It, this was the time. I got him. I got the roadrunner this time. This is what's going to happen. I got him. And every time the roadrunner outwitted him. Uh, and that's kind of what this reminds me of. Every time they think they've got Jesus cornered, every time they think they got it figured out on how they're going to trap him, Jesus outwits them. So let's set the, 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 the scene here. First of all, we find ourselves in the temple here in, verse, in chapter 1, verses, eight and, uh, verses 1 and 2. Jesus went unto the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning He came again into the temple, and all the people came unto Him, and He sat down and taught them. Uh, and so we see the timing to kind of bring this into perspective. As we closed out chapter number 7, everybody had gone to their own home. Now if this is chronological, and this happens, some will say it is, some will say it's not. There's no reason to think that it is not. It doesn't change the story if it's not. But um, if that's the case, it seems that Jesus went to Bethany, which was in the Mount of Olives. Uh, you say, why Bethany? If you'll remember, there was a home there of three people that Jesus loved quite a bit. Uh, and that was Mary and Martha and Lazarus. They lived there in Bethany. Uh, and Jesus often went and stayed with them as He was traveling. They would host Him as He was traveling. So it seems that that is where He went. He went to their home. Uh, in verse number 2, we see that uh, He is teaching them. As his habits seemed to be, Jesus would go to the Mount of Olives during the evening. He would stay there during the evening. And then he would return back to the temple early the next morning. There's a couple of things noteworthy here. Uh, we we kind of read verse 2 and we just kind of skip right through it. Uh, but there's a couple of things that are noteworthy. Number one, the people were still coming to hear what he had to say. The religious leaders are against him. The religious leaders have made it pretty clear they're against Him, have made it pretty clear they want to do whatever they have to do to get rid of Him. They've made that clear, yet the people are still saying, hey, we want to hear Him. Why? Because we looked at last Sunday, they, even those that the religious leaders sent out to arrest Him, they said, why didn't you arrest Him? He said, because never a man spoke like this man. They wanted to hear Him, and so here they are, though this could ruin them, spiritually speaking, their standing with the spiritual leaders and in the temple, they decided, hey, we still want to hear what He has to say. Folks, that's the power of the Word of God. You show me somebody that does not want to be in the house of God and listening to the Word of God, I'm going to show you somebody that doesn't love God. You show me somebody that doesn't want to spend time in the Word of God, and I'm going to show you somebody that does not love God. Because if we love God, if we respect Him for who He is and what He's done, then we're going to want to study about Him. We're going to want to read His Word. We're going to want to meet with Him. Amen? Amen. Now, I realize things come up and they separate us. And, you know, uh, um, we, we've had this uh, big old virus and all this, that, and the other, and it's pulled people out of the church. And, you know, uh, you know, what happens is now we're back in the church. Guess what? A lot of people have gotten out of the habit of being in the church. And now we've got to get them back in the habit of being in the church. You know, they, they, they've gotten used to doing different things during that church time. <laughs> And so now they're still doing those different things. It's not that they're afraid to be in the church. It's not that they're afraid of uh, the coronavirus. It's that they just don't see the need to be in the church. Well, what's happening in the church? We're teaching the Word of God. And if you love Him, guess what? You want to be under the teaching of His Word. Yeah. That's where they wanted to be. They gathered around. They still wanted to hear what Jesus had to say. Number two, we noticed that He sat down. Now, that might be different for us because as far as I know, probably all of you, as, as far back as you can remember, going to church, the preacher was always where? Standing in the pulpit preaching, right? That, that's just how we've learned. That's how we were. I, I don't know when that got changed. I've never really done the history lesson to find out. But it used to be the authoritative position of the teacher was what? Sitting. And he would sit, and of course all of them would sit, and they would gather around him, uh, and he would teach. It was showing the authority of him sitting amongst them. Okay. Now people say, well, why does the preacher stand up on a pulpit? It's not because I'm any more important than you, it's just because it's easier to see. <laughs> now, of course, I'm pretty hard to miss anyway, but... And, and our church is, is, is built wonderfully with this little incline. I love that because we have that, that little, what I call stadium seating, so that makes it easier. But that's the only reason that the preacher stands up in the place. He's not any more important than anybody else that's doing the will of God, okay? Amen. But Jesus sat, sat amongst them. 
And notice number three, he taught them. Understand, this is a man who knows that people are seeking his life. They're trying to kill him, and he knows they're trying to kill him. We, we looked at that in chapter 7. He said, you're trying to kill me. He knew that. Yet he still comes to the church house, to the temple, and teaches the people. Amen. Even knowing that it put his very life at risk. Even knowing that they're going to be listening to every single word that he says, waiting for him to stumble or trip up or fail. And he's still doing that. Why? Because he was a man on a mission. There, there was no time to waste. Jesus knew his earthly ministry was coming to a close. We're not very far from it right here. And so if he's going to teach them, now's the time to teach them. If he's going to prepare them, now's the time to prepare them. Folks, we, we need to get all the learning that we can. Because we don't know when we're going to need it. Parents, grandparents, you need to instill everything that you can into your children now because you don't know how much longer you have here. Amen. Don't waste time. Luke chapter 19, verse 10, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. That was His mission. So that's what He's doing. He's teaching them. Folks, that's what we need to do. And I, I, I love preaching. I love having a lot of fun when I preach. I love, to, I, I love those things. But, but if you leave here on Sunday and I ain't told you nothing new about the gospel or, or, or explain to you the gospel or try to help challenge you with the gospel, then we've accomplished nothing. Why? Because I can promise you, I don't know when the Lord's coming, but I know we're one day closer today than we were yesterday. Amen. So I need to teach you what I can to get you ready for that trip home. Amen? Amen. Well, verse 3, we see the trap. First of all, look at the proposal that's set up in verses 3 through 5. It says, And the scribes and the Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery, and when they had set her in the midst, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses is in the law, and Moses in the law commanded us that, she, that, that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? So verse number 3 here, while Jesus is teaching the scribes and the Pharisees, they bring a woman uh, in, who they say has been caught in the act of adultery, and they set her before Jesus right in the front of Him as if you would somebody that's on trial. They put her right there. Verse 4, notice that they review the accusation before Jesus. Uh, interesting enough, they address Him as Master or Teacher. Knowing good and well they rejected his teaching. Knowing good and well they don't want to listen to what he has to say. Knowing good and well they've rejected everything else, he says. But now all of a sudden, oh, master, teacher. You know what I call that? I call that putting honey on the hook. We're going to try to hook him, so let's get something that we can, that we can hook him with. You ever set a mouse trap with no cheese? Or peanut butter? I ain't going to get it. I'm going to tell you, you want to catch this big old boy, stick a big old pot of spaghetti on that mousetrap. You got me. <laughs> I'm figuring, big as I am, that thing snaps. I probably got a little while. I can still eat some of that spaghetti before all is over and said and done with. Just saying. Putting honey on the hook. So, master, you know, they, they, you know, here's the same people that was going to kill him yesterday, but now they're saying master teacher. Verse 5, they begin to review the law with Jesus. I, I love this. They're reviewing the law with Jesus as if He doesn't know it. The law said she must be stoned is what they say. Actually, what the law said in Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 22, they kind of added their own thing to it, but this is what it says. If a man be found lying with a woman married to an husband, then, she, then they shall both of them die. Both the man that lay with the woman and the woman, so shalt thou be, thou put away evil from Israel. Hmm. So, in other words, if they've committed adultery, what happens to them? How many of y'all think that might cure some fornication around here these days? <laughs> Do you know that on the books, on the law books of just about every state, adultery is still illegal? 
Did you know that? They're not prosecuting it. Why? Because they don't care about the law. Because that's, that's too biblical for them. That's too spiritual for them. So people can get out here and run around and shack up, do whatever they want to, but the law on the book still says it's illegal. Jesus said, that the law said stone them. I bet that'd cure a lot of things. <laughs> but it's interesting. Review the law. It said, who, who, who dies? Some over here said it. Who dies? Both. Both. Where's the man? Somebody's shooting now. <laughs> Say we stone him. We ain't shooting him. <laughs> but it's interesting. Where's the man? If they're, if they're so worried about the law, the law says that both of them die, but they bring the woman, not the man. And they say, so Jesus, what do you say? I can just hear the smugness in their voice through this, through, through, as I read this passage. What do you think, Jesus? This is what the law says. What do you say? Look at the plan. John reveals their plan to us in verse 6. This they said, tempting him that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. John makes it clear that they had no concern about the affair. They weren't worried about this woman being in adultery. This was obvious by the absence of the second party. I got news for you, it takes two to tango. If adultery is committed, it took two people. So why didn't they bring the man? I'll tell you why. They thought and assumed that Jesus would oppose stoning the woman. Uh, and Jesus being a man, He would tend to have more compassion on a woman than He would on the man. And so if they brought the man, He might say, well, stone him. So they didn't bring the man. Oh, by the way, let's bring this to today. You find a woman today that has committed adultery, and boy, we put an A on her chest real quick, don't we? Boy, she's shunned from society. Now, by the way, guilty, okay? She's guilty. But what about the man? We don't, we don't even look at him the same today, do we? When I say we, I'm talking about the world as a whole, not necessarily you. So you can imagine what they did. That was the assumption. You see, they're not worried about the adultery. They're just looking for something that they can use to make an accusation against Jesus. They want Him to oppose the law so they can say, look, the law says this, He says it doesn't say that. And they can turn Him. But I love the end of this verse. Jesus stoops down in what I call doodling. He just starts doodling on the ground as if He doesn't even hear Him. You know, why do I call it doodling? And I've heard messages and people, people talking about what he wrote on the ground. You don't know what he wrote on the ground. Man, he might have been drawing pictures of dolphins. We don't know. I imagine this, if it was something important that we needed to know, John would have told us. Amen? We don't know what he was writing. All we know is that he's writing and John says as if he didn't even hear him. By the way, that's in italic, so that was added by the translators. Now, they've set the trap. <laughs> They're trying to find a reason to accuse Jesus. And Jesus outwits them. He flips it on him. Look at the trial here, if you will. First of all, look at their persistence. At the first part of verse eight, verse 7 says, So when they continued asking Him, Jesus did not offer an immediate answer. And so they figure they've got him cornered, they've got him trapped, and so they just keep on asking and keep on asking and just keep on pushing. We've got him now. He's on the ropes. Let's keep on pushing him. He's about to mess up. And then look at the probe in, verse, in the end of verse 7. 
He lifted up Himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. So finally Jesus stands back up and He addresses them. Surely not the answer that they were looking for, nor the answer they were hoping for. Jesus says, search yourselves. Let him who is without sin, let him cast the first stone. Maybe this is a good time to remind you that the Jews had no authority to execute capital punishment. That's why when they went to kill Jesus, they had to turn Him over to the Romans because they couldn't kill Him. They didn't have that authority. So what we have here is Jesus has actually called their bluff. You can't kill her if you want to. Because you can't execute capital punishment. So He says, let him without sin, let him cast the first stone. In His answer, He neither opposed the law nor gave them pleasure in trapping Him. I'm going to tell you, if you want to see the master of responses, <laughs> read after Jesus. I love it. They asked Jesus a question, He asked them a question. <laughs> You're not going to trap Him. Hey, He's going to outwit you. How many of you have ever been trapped? How many of you ever knew it right as you said it, but it was too late? <laughs> You're not going to outwit Jesus. He's going to win it every time. So instead, He turned their own conscience loose on them. By the way, learn the lesson, folks. You will not outsmart Jesus. Quit trying. You ever prayed something, but in your heart there was something else? Lord, please bless this family. And in your heart, God, I hate that family. <laughs> you know why you're laughing? Because it's true. Amen. You didn't fool Jesus. Nope. He knows your heart. We should have been praying, Lord, open my heart to this family. Amen. Change my heart about this family. Amen. Well, then we see the parting. Look at verses 8 and 9. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. I skip verse 8. And he stooped again down to the ground, began to write on the ground. So Jesus again stoops back down. He begins what I call doodling on the ground again. Maybe he had to finish his dolphin. Maybe a couple little fish, a little Nemo, something there. But I don't know what he's drawing. But he left conviction and consequence to do it. The conviction and, and conscience to do its work. And notice what happens. One by one, starting with the eldest and the most respected. You'd think they would have stayed the longest, wouldn't you? But the eldest and the most respected, they left first. And then one by one, the would-be accusers departed. I can imagine once that first highly respected elder left, everybody else goes, oh, if he can't throw a stone, neither can I. And one by one, they all walk away. This left just Jesus and the woman. Notice that she's still standing in the midst. She's still standing in the place of the accused, even though there's no one left to accuse her. So she's still standing in that place, if you will, on trial, but there's no witnesses anymore against her. Which brings us to the teaching here in verses 10 and 11. First notice the question, when Jesus had lifted up Himself and saw none but the woman, He said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. With all the would-be accusers gone, Jesus stands back up. He addresses the lady. He says, Where are they? Where are the accusers? Is there no one left to condemn you? Who's, who's witnessing against you? Who's testifying against you? And she responds, Nobody. No man. There's no one left. And look at the quest in verse 11. 
And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Jesus gives her some good news and some directions. He says, I don't condemn you either. Go and sin no more. Now listen to me. Please listen to me. Pay attention. I don't want you leaving here thinking something that you're not supposed to think. Listen to what's going on. Please remember the focus of this story was not on the adulterous woman. The focus of this story was on the scribes and the Pharisees and their try to trap Jesus. That's the focus of the story. That's the context of the story. Not the adulterous woman. We're not told anything about her experience or what she was going through or what was going through her heart. It could be her addressing him as Lord shows her acceptance of who he was. We don't know that. Understand his words do not necessarily imply forgiveness. Jesus did not anywhere in here did he say you're forgiven. He said, did anybody else condemn you? Then neither am I. In other words, he was refusing to condemn her, or his refusal to condemn her does not condone her sin, just a denial to assume judicial responsibility for it. Jesus says, I'm not going to be the judge. It's not what he was there for. Jesus knew what was happening. Again, the focus wasn't on the woman, the focus was on the scribes and the Pharisees. And he sends her away with a warning Stop. Sinning. That's what it means. Go and sin no more. Stop sinning is what he told her. In other words, you're in this position to begin with because of your sin. If you hadn't sinned, you wouldn't be here. So stop. Now I know many have camped down on that last statement of this passage, go and sin no more. And by the way, what a challenge that is and what a worthy goal that is. We should try to live a life free from sin. That should be our goal. But I also realize as long as we have a sin nature, that's not going to happen. I believe we can go extended periods of time without sin. But there was only one sinless. And that's Jesus. And if we could live a life without sin, we wouldn't have needed Him to go to the cross for us. Now, I'm not one of those that like to use God's grace as a crutch or an excuse to sin. We hear it all the time. Oh, you're just going to have to forgive me, you know. I, I, I'm just a whole sinner saved by grace. In other words, you know what that really means? I knew exactly what I was doing. I didn't care that I was sinning because I'm just a sinner saved by grace and I needed an excuse and I have an excuse and Jesus is my excuse to sin. Paul says, should we sin that grace may abound? He says, what? God forbid. Never use the grace of God as an excuse to sin. If anything, it ought to be a motivation to do better. The grace of God, what He's forgiven us from, the mercy of God, it ought to give us a challenge to do better. It ought to bother us when we sin. If you can sin without it bothering you, something's wrong. You're not where you're supposed to be or need to be. If you can continually excuse your sin, something's wrong. Yes, I'm thankful for the grace of God. I'm thankful for the mercy of God for when I slip up. But I'm not supposed to slip up knowing I can go back. And, I mean, this isn't just a free pass. All of that being said, we need to understand this passage in the context of which it was written. This whole episode was one plotted out by the scribes and the Pharisees to trap Jesus, to give them a reason to find an accusation against Him. Looking at it in that context, we see that His accusers were clearly outwitted. I look at all the times in my ministry that people have tried to trap me in an effort to somehow justify themselves and their unwillingness to receive the truth of the Word of God. You ever notice that? 
If people can find an accusation against a sinner, I mean against a Christian, somehow makes them feel better. That's sin nature. How many got brothers and sisters? How many remember when mama called you in there, you was in trouble? How soon did it take you to throw your brother or sister under the bus? Not long. Why? Because if I can distract from me to them, then maybe my punishment won't be so bad. Maybe I won't look so bad. So you think of something they did worse. Now we all hear, you know, we get people out here, well, is that how a Christian's supposed to act? Now, by the way, the answer is usually what? No, it's not. But the whole reason they said that was because they want to justify themselves. We see it happen all the time. Church, we serve a God who sees through all of that and sees it for what it is. Try what you want or how you want, but God will outwit you every single time, I can promise you. So we need to learn to trust Him. We need to learn to surrender to Him. We need to learn to follow Him. Stand for Him. And know that you will always, as long as you do those things, you will always be on the winning side. So let the world come at you with whatever they want. He'll see you through it. He's not here to condemn us. He wants us to do exactly what He told that woman to do. Go and sin no more. He forgave us by going on Calvary's cross. When we put our faith in the finished work of Jesus on Calvary's cross, He saved us. That was His goal. That's what He came here for, to seek and to save that which was lost. So stop letting Satan, that great accuser, beat you down. Now again, don't use the grace as an excuse to sin, but understand when you do sin, understand when you do stumble, that God is there, that Jesus died for you, He loves you, He wants to forgive you, just confess it over to Him. And guess what? He'll cleanse it and make it new. Don't live a beaten life. i got news for you. We've all failed this week. And I imagine all of us have beaten, been beaten by Satan by it, wouldn't it? Why? That's why the Bible calls him that great accuser. Because he wants to divide us and separate us from God. We can't allow that to happen. And by the way, he does use the people of the world to do that. Just like he did with the scribes and Pharisees. Always looking for something against Jesus. Folks, just stay true to Jesus. And I promise you, He'll outwit them every time. What are you going through? What are you facing today? What are you struggling with? Bring it to Him. He has the answer. If you'll but seek it. And He'll give it to you. If you'll but ask. And by the way, while you're following Him, that's some pretty good advice. Go and sin no more. Stop living in sin. And we'll find that we have far fewer problems as we journey through this life. Amen? Whatever it is, you come and trust Him with it today. Sam's going to come in just a moment. That's the song he's going to play, Trust and Obey. You come, surrender it over to Him and trust Him with it. Because i got news for you, church. He's the only one that we're going to have to answer to. So He's the one that we've got to make sure everything is right with. So if you're here this morning and everything's not right, bring it down to this altar and get it right with Him. Don't worry about this world. Don't worry about them pointing the finger. It's like my mama used to say. Every time you point your finger, guess what? Your mama said it to you. What would she say? Yeah, three pointing right back at you. So I tried to point like this. <laughs> Surrender to God. Trust Him. And He'll see you through it.
Let's pray. Father, we love you and praise you. Thank you again for the day that you've given. Thank you for the opportunity once again to be in your house under your word. Father, what a reassurance we have in this passage. Lord, even as the world sought accusation against you, Father, you outwitted them. And Father, we can do the same thing if we'll just trust and follow you. So Lord, whatever it is that Lord we're going through today, whatever it is that we're struggling with, whatever it is that the world is pointing their finger at and accusing us of, Father, help us to surrender it over to you because you are the one that we're going to have to answer to. Father, whatever needs are represented here this morning, Lord, I realize if you, they will bring them to you, you will meet them. You will guide, you'll direct. Help them come and seek and ask. And add your blessings to it all. And we'll praise you for it in Christ's name. Amen. I ask you to stand as Sam plays.